Curb Door with me, Melbourne musician Mark Hughes, as I share the making of my new album under my project name, Sans Mantra. Follow Sans Mantra Studio for insights into the world of songwriting, sessions, gigs, and more. Hey there listeners, greetings and welcome to another week of Sans Mantra Studio, episode 11 in fact. Thank you for clicking on this and as you can hear it's a rainy, rainy afternoon. This is the cool change after what's been an incredibly hot and uncomfortable week. I'm sitting here in my studio sweating as I speak because it's still humid. This is typical Melbourne weather if you're not from Australia. And speaking of which, I had a look the other day at where my listeners are from around the world, and I realised that I've got listeners in not only the United States, but Spain, Mexico, Romania, Russia, Brazil, Poland, and even Sweden. So, thank you so much for listening. And buenas tardes to all my Mexican and Spanish listeners in particular, just because I like saying that. A quick plug for my single, The Silent Crowd, which is available on all streaming platforms as well as at my YouTube channel. I released The Silent Crowd on my birthday, the 1st of October last year, and it's the first of a few singles that I'll be releasing off an album that I have coming out this year in a few months. I've got lots of new music for you this week, and the first track is actually an instrumental mix of the song that I was just talking about, The Silent Crowd. This mix was actually made at the same time as when the single came out and I sat on it until now just because I wanted to promote the main single as it was but quite often these days people will do an instrumental mix of their song if it's got lots of nice instrumentation if they think that it might be able to be repurposed for something else in what they call a sync, which is synchronising original music with TV and films, which is the great dream, of course, for a lot of musicians, because, as you may or may not know, um, people don't actually buy music anymore. So sync opportunities are a good way for musicians to make money if they're lucky enough to get them. So this song has a lot of different elements on it, which I thought would make it possibly marketable as an instrumental song. And either way, I think it sounds great. I mean, I'm biased, of course, but I really like just the sound of this song without my vocal on it anyway, just with the instruments. And here it is.
that's the Silent Crowd instrumental mix, which will be available on Spotify and all other streaming platforms very shortly. It was meant to be today, but I don't think I got it submitted in time for them to process it and do everything they need to do. But it will be up available very soon, so keep an eye out for that. Listening to the Silent Crowd instrumental mix reminded me of some of the soundtrack work I've done in the past. When I first set up my studio here at home around 2006, I think it was, I immediately started getting in touch with people who might need music for their video. And I ended up doing soundtrack work for a couple of young filmmakers and a couple of them I think still stand up. This first one is a piece called Copy Girl, which was a kind of a cute little short film about a girl, the photocopy girl in an office. And I originally sampled a photocopier to get the beat of the um, tempo of the song. But then I revisited the track because I really liked it. It had a sort of a Latin feel and sort of updated it, I guess, sort of smoothed it out a bit and everything. So the photocopier isn't still on this current version, but I really like it. Nonetheless, I think in my mind it's got a bit of a Warner Brothers cartoon feel about it. Anyway, this is called The Copy Girl. enjoy doing soundtrack music I think it's a bit like the saying all care no responsibility because you don't have to worry about lyrics you don't have to worry about putting a good vocal on there if that's something that you're a little bit self-conscious about which I can be from time to time you also don't have to worry about um, having anything longer than really a minute or two minutes in most cases so it's just pure fun and you get to use samples you need a sample library generally unless you've got access to perhaps an orchestra or, you know, a small local orchestra or friends who play strings or friends who play other instruments that you don't play. But generally these days, sample libraries, you know, that work inside a a computer software program are readily available and they sound incredible. And I think to my ears, uh, it sounds like some films, some Hollywood films even, are using these samples because the strings and the brass and everything just sound so perfect. They're just so polished. There there are no rough edges in terms of timing or tuning particularly. So these sample libraries are what most composers, I guess, are using for film soundtrack work. Certainly, I think, for um, a lot of perhaps lower budget sort of films where they can't afford to hire an orchestra. Anyway... 
This next track is a piece called Car Chase, for want of a better term. And this was a piece of music that I came up with for my brother Paul Hughes, who is a cinematographer of note. He's actually an award-winning cinematographer. But he made a film, well, he started making because he never finished it, unfortunately. But he made a really cool film called Flush quite a while ago, probably around about the same time as The Copy Girl, the last piece. And he asked me to do the music for it. And although he never finished it, which I think is a shame, um, I was really pleased with the piece of music that came out of it. So this is called Car Chase. So at the start of the pandemic in 2020, a lot of people were pivoting, as they say. I'm going to pivot, 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 pivot. Everyone was pivoting. And I attempted my own form of pivoting by trying to get into voiceover work, believe it or not. And I had met someone who was doing voiceover work at a gig that I played at the end of 2019. It was actually a wedding gig. I'm not too proud to say. I played a wedding gig and the drummer there was actually the voice of a very well-known chain of white goods, the, their commercials. But um, he gave me some tips on what to do and how to go about it. So I haven't actually cracked any voiceover work yet, but because we were in lockdown at the time when I was talking to the particular agency that I got in touch with, I offered to record my voiceover demo at home, which increasingly is what a lot of people do because of the affordability of studio equipment at home. So I made a reel and I won't play the whole thing to you in its entirety because it's a bit dry. It's just different styles of, you know, generic sort of ads. But I will play you this one piece, which I kind of like. I approach the whole thing with a sense of humour and with my tongue in my cheek a little bit. And to that end, I came up with this piece, which is kind of like meant to be a movie trailer, I guess. Anyway, without any further ado, please enjoy this. This is Escape from Preston Woolies. 
loosely based on the third-hand account of someone who wasn't really paying attention, the story that shocked the northern suburbs. What's happening in aisle three? Nothing. Just act natural for Christ's sake. Netflix's new limited event series from director Baz Luhrmann boy, Escape from Preston Woolies. What's happening in aisle seven? Same as aisle three. Nothing. One of the most daring trolley roundups in Aussie supermarket history. I'm down here every day. I bring the bananas. I bring the oranges. You can't handle the fruit! Starring Oscar winners Hugh Jackby Nimbleman and Naomi Watts on second. The brand new event series, Escape from Preston Woolies, now streaming only on Netflix. So in keeping with the soundtrack theme for this week, this week's highly recommended playlist is all about soundtracks, soundtrack music. These are some of my favourite soundtrack pieces, not necessarily from my favourite films, but definitely some of my favourite pieces of music. And I've not even tried to cover a wide range of composers here because I wanted to keep it to what I really, really like. And that's really a handful of composers, although I do listen to more than just these few people that I've got on the playlist. But these are some of my favourites, like I said. And because it's soundtrack music, there's a lot of it. So this week's playlist is quite long. It's a bit longer than normal. The first composer is a guy named Michael Giacchino, who I first heard about when he did The Incredibles, which came out in 2004. And apart from being a fantastic film, just one of those rare animated movies that adults can enjoy as well as kids. I suspect actually that it's kind of made for adults in a sense. It's very knowing. It's as much as it's about superheroes, it's about a lost era or a bygone era. And that really is the 50s and the 60s maybe the 70s even, but sort of around that sort of nebulous period of the 60s and the 70s. The Incredibles, even though it's set in the current day, it's one of those movies where there's an obvious nod to a previous sort of aesthetic. So when you look at their lounge room, the family of The Incredibles, they've got very 60s and 70s decor in their lounge room. Anyway, Michael Giacchino does a fantastic job of nailing the real kind of spy movie sound from the Bond themes, the really epic over the top, like James Bond is climbing up the inside of the dome and he has to deactivate the bomb and there's a repetitive motif going. A motif for those that don't know is basically another word for a short melody. So you'll find in James Bond movies, there's, you know, the crucial moment, say in the third act, when everything hinges on him getting to a certain point in time and deactivating something, there'll be a repetitive motif that just goes on and on, in a lot of the early ones anyway, in the 60s. And Michael Giacchino it just nails this sound so well. And this whole soundtrack is just a fantastic soundtrack. And what I find interesting about his music is it's very crisp. So I I don't actually know how much involvement he has in the production and the recording of the actual music. I probably would guess that it's a lot, but it's very, very crisp. His music is very clear and crisp and well-defined, which appeals to me. And he has very strong melodies and very well orchestrated and, and arranged, of course. But there are two tracks on this playlist from him. The first one is actually not from The Incredibles. It's a track called Bundle of Joy from a movie, again animated, called Inside Out. And this is one of those tracks that's just really cute and very pretty. And you probably wouldn't find this sort of track anywhere else, this piece of music. So that's one of the great things about soundtrack music is that it gives music like this a place to live. The next few pieces are by one of my favourite soundtrack composers, a guy named Thomas Newman, who I really love listening to when I'm doing work that doesn't involve music at, at the computer. And I'll just put on an automatically generated playlist of Thomas Newman, and there's rarely a track that I want to skip. The first two tracks here are from the movie American Beauty, and I think the first one, the title track, American Beauty, is 
quite an iconic track by now. I think a lot of people know this music. And then the other one, Any Other Name. In fact, one of these pieces, I can't remember which, sounds a lot like one of the famous ringtones that we have now. But Thomas Newman he has a very delicate touch, I find, and he uses a lot of effects to get delays happening that set up rhythms that wouldn't be that easy to create if you were playing them just organically. So he'll set things up that kind of bounce along and ping and repeat. And he has a, a very light touch with strings as well, which I really like. The next two are from the second best exotic Marigold Hotel. And I really like these because he mixes the elements of East and West now, if you don't know about the movie, it's about a, a bunch of English retirees that moved to India. So it's got that mix of East and obviously with India and, and West of the, the English. And he really mixes the elements very well, but he doesn't lose his own voice, which I think would be very hard to do. It, it It's not that hard once you know how to write music and arrange it to do a pastiche of something. But I think what is harder is to do something that's still true to yourself and has your voice but incorporates those elements. And Thomas Newman does that very, very well. I really like his music. The next one is his piece, Writings on the Wall from Spectre, which he did the music for. And that, again, is a great example of him fitting in with the traditional James Bond type music, but still sounding like himself. That's a great piece. The next one is another cute one from the animated film Wild. E and that's called Eve and that's another cute one now the next composer I just love this guy for this soundtrack alone and this might surprise some of you that are listening and known me personally um, but this soundtrack is is one of my Desert Island albums it's um it's the soundtrack to Under the Tuscan Sun starring Diane Lane and it's by a composer named Christoph Beck, who's an American. And this soundtrack, it's just some of the most beautiful music I've ever heard. Now, I've picked four tracks, even though I could have put the whole album on this. This is just so perfect in so many ways. The strings, the timbres he manages to get from the strings and the different elements. Again, there's a lot of what I was talking about earlier with Thomas Newman using delays and effects to set up rhythmic things that continue very lightly. With this album, he does that beautifully, but it also, because it's set in Italy, partly, there are some beautiful Italian-sounding tracks as well with piano accordion and, you know, some of those sorts of instruments. But the track Catherine's Fountain, I think, is just one of my favourite pieces of music ever. And my brother Paul actually described a song by Stevie Wonder, You Are the Sunshine of My Life, as it's a bit like slipping into a warm bath. Now, I would certainly say that about this particular piece, Catherine's Fountain. The only thing that I regret about this piece is that it doesn't go for longer. It's only two minutes. I wish it went for about five. The next composer is Howard Shaw, who I didn't really know much about before I heard his music in Peter Jackson's Lord of the Rings, which everyone knows about, of course. And I think Howard Shaw, just for his score to this set of movies alone, is a genius, truly. One thing that's really interesting about soundtrack music is that the way composers split it up, and thinking about this the other day, they will probably do this out of necessity as much as anything, I would imagine. But what they will do is they will assign a motif to each particular character or a piece of music. You know, it could be a motif or it could be longer. And whenever that character appears back on the screen, they will have that music playing in some form or another. Quite often they'll play with the motifs as well. So if the character undergoes some sort of arc during the course of the film, then that motif might change a little bit towards the end. To the point where sometimes I read about composers and what they've done, the way they've layered it, I think I wouldn't actually pick that up, you know, unless you'd pointed that out to me. It's so subtle, but it's there nonetheless. And like I just said, I think maybe that was born out of necessity because there's just so much music to write for a movie. I can't imagine how you would do it when you're scoring music for a three hour plus movie in this instance. In fact, I remember watching the making of DVD of Lord of the Rings when it came out and there's a shot of Howard Shaw clearly hasn't slept for a couple of days. He just looks completely demented and he's got a bunch of sheets of music under his arm and he's going into his hotel room and he drops the music and it just goes everywhere and it's one of those moments where you can just tell he's beside himself. He's trying to get all this music finished for the deadline. 
fantastic music in Lord of the Rings. I've picked four of my favourite general pieces, and then there are two songs with vocals, which I'm going to put in anyway, even though they're not instrumental. And that's because Howard Shaw wrote the music to these two songs and because they're just fantastic songs. The first one is Long Ways to Go Yet slash Gollum's Song, and that features Emilinia Torini. And that's just the most incredible piece of music to sum up Gollum's character. If you've watched Lord of the Rings, if you're a fan, you know that Gollum is just a totally, hopelessly wretched creature. And this music really sums him up, the whole creepiness and the wretchedness and the regret and the the misery that he has inside him. And then the next one is a beautiful song called Into the West, which is sung by Annie Lennox. The next bunch of songs is by a French composer named Alexander Desplat. And that's just a mix of different pieces that I really like there. I've got one from a movie called Extremely Loud and Incredibly Close, I don't actually know anything about that movie. I've just heard this on Spotify. The next one is, again, the same. It's Mr. Mustafa, and um, I don't know that either, the movie. The next one is Amy from a movie called Little Women that's fairly recent, from what I can tell. Alexander Desplat has a beautiful touch as well, very, very delicate, and he doesn't waste notes, in my opinion. And then the last two, Obituary and Elisa's Theme, from two different movies there, which you can check out. I'll have all this in the description, of course, in the YouTube video and also on all the streaming platforms for podcasts, as well as a live link to this Spotify playlist if you're able to access Spotify. And then the very last song on this playlist is one of my favourite pieces of music. This is the end credits to the very famous film by Steven Spielberg, E.T., and this is by the... Equally famous John Williams, who wrote the music for Star Wars, Raiders of the Lost Ark, had a fantastic collaboration with Steven Spielberg and George Lucas, and just wrote some of the most iconic music of the last century. But the main theme to E.T., I find, is just so beautifully moving. I just, I had to put it on there. And a little anecdote about this story. When my family saw this movie, when it came out, my little brother Paul, who I... I think this is the third mention in this episode for you, Paul, if you're listening. Uh, we went to see E.T. at the local cinema and Paul was only, it was probably four or five, I think. And if you've never seen E.T., it's a real tearjerker because there's a big farewell at the end and it's very, very sad. It's very emotional. And we finished watching this movie and we came out and Paul wouldn't stop crying. It was so, it was so upsetting. It was so emotional. And we walked up to the the local fish and chip shop to get some dinner on the way home. And the lady behind the counter actually felt so sorry for this little kid because he was very cute as a little kid too, my brother, that she gave him one of those little orange drinks in a square box, just free, just to console him. So, um, yeah, I'll never forget that. (laughs) One interesting thing about this music in E.T. is... When I listen to it now, I can hear the imperfections in the performance. There are notes that aren't quite 100% in tune or in time. And that's because there were no computers back there. There was no music software and every note was played live and there was no messing around with it in the computer later on, whether that's replacing it with a sample or tuning it up in the computer as regular listeners would have heard me do just a demo of of that with strings in one of the earlier episodes of this podcast. So there was none of that back in 1977 or 1982, whenever it came out. There was no post-production tuning or any of that sort of editing. So it's really funny how our ears become attuned to hearing everything just be perfect these days and when you listen to an old score like that which still stands up as a a beautiful piece of music played extremely well you can hear the imperfections and I wonder if we haven't lost something in this era of pro-tooled perfected gridded up perfect music Well, that's all I've got time for this week. As always, a big thank you to the following people in alphabetical order for all their support. Thank you, Anthony Ray, Beck Godfrey, Campbell McNaughton, Jill Harvey, Gordon Thompson, Jody McNaughton, Justin Slay, Logan Sinclair, Lyndon Wesley, Neva Connell, Nicola Platt, Paul Appleman, Paul Richards, Pete Sim, Salman Khan, Sharon Swan, Sylvia Bucks, Warren McColl Jones, Barbara Renz, Paul Hughes, Natalie Guglielmi, Graham Hughes, Gloria Kennedy, 
and especially my ever-loving family, Helen Hughes and Bailey Hughes. I'll be back here again with a new episode next Friday. If you've enjoyed this episode and you haven't yet subscribed, please go and hit the subscribe button on YouTube or follow me on any of the streaming platforms. Give the video a thumbs up, leave a comment. I'd love to hear what you think. Till next week, have a great week and I'll see you then. And don't forget to... Like, share, subscribe. Why don't you just like?